Oh, no uh, more Python. No, I, I can't remember. So it's uh, mirror structure constants via non-Archimedean analytic disks. Thank you, Jason, again for the introduction. Um, so in the uh, pre-talk, I explained the motivations uh, for counting non-Archimedean curves. And when we say to count something, uh, but to do it uh, in mathematics, it's not so simple because the why the count is well defined, why the number is not infinity, for example, uh, then we have to study very carefully uh, uh, the properties of the moduli spaces. When we want to count something, we look at the moduli space of all such objects, and we need to establish enough properties so that eventually the count can make sense. So in this, uh, now in, uh, starting from now, I'll explain uh, all the crucial properties of this moduli space of uh, non-Archimedean analytic curves uh, that we managed to prove so that eventually uh, it makes sense to count and also uh, the count gives all the expected properties that we want. Okay. Let's go to... Uh, um, uh, here. Uh, so, uh, wh when... Let me put it here. Yes. So uh, first uh, condition I want to put uh, for the counts uh, is a boundary condition for the re reg regularity of the boundary. Uh, the trouble is that if we just uh, naively consider the moduli space of non-Archimedean curves with boundary, or the moduli space of uh, non-Archimedean analytic disks, it's clearly uh, infinite dimensional and uh, poorly behaved. So let me start with this very basic example. Um, um, let's just consider maps from a uh, unit disk over non-Archimedean field K to itself, uh, sending also uh, the boundary circle to itself. And uh, it's not hard to prove that all such maps are given by power series, uh, because we only need to know where x goes, uh, where a co we fix a coordinate x, and we want to know where x goes. So first of all, this power series is an element in the theta algebra, which, is, which means that the power series has the convergence condition that the norm of AI uh, goes to zero when I goes to infinity. And furthermore, the condition that the circle goes to itself means that uh, implies that the norm of AI is equal to one for exactly one I. And that is the degree of this map phi. And all, the norm of all the other coefficients is less than i. So then we see that uh, now let's consider the moduli space MD consisting of such maps of given degree d. And we see that this moduli space is pretty undesirable. First of all, uh, this moduli space is infinite dimensional because our conditions are really so weak. We ask like one coefficient to have norm one and all the other coefficients to have norm less than one. But you can just, uh, fixing a norm is really weak. You can still move all the, ad all the coefficients and you ha there's too much freedom here. And furthermore, uh, also we see that the degree feels not good because the degree is like this one i such that the norm of AI is one, then somehow you can just uh, interpolate between different degrees, like you increase the norm of the another coefficient and then they will be equally one and then you can drop. It's just uh, you mix all the degrees together. Um, yeah, and we see that uh, this situation is really different from complex analytic geometry. Because in complex analytic geometry, all such maps are given by so-called finite Blaschke products, uh, which is an easy corollary of the Schwarz lemma. Um, and in particular, all such maps are kind of given by the zeros. Uh, you only, it's determined by finitely many parameters. Um, so let's go back to non-Archimedean geometry. Uh, we want to get rid of all these so, so we see that what's really causing problem for us is that we have too many freedom. And we want to get m rid of as much freedom as we can. So one way is we just want to get rid of all the higher order coefficients, AI, uh, for i greater than d. 
And in this way, we think maybe we can separate all these modular spaces MD. Yeah. So now there is a very simple and, uh, observation. Uh, uh, it says that if phi is equal, so we want to get rid of the high, higher order coefficients, and then we will get a polynomial. And the simple observation is that this phi from the disk to the disk becomes a polynomial of degree d if and only if we have the following extension property. So if and only if we can extend it to a map between p1, because we know for a map between p1, even if it's analytic, uh, we can't have much freedom because in analytic geometry, we have the Gaga principle saying that as long as something is proper, it's the same as algebraic geometry. So here, if we have an analytic map between P1 and between P1, that is the same as an as a algebraic map. In other words, it's the same as given by a polynomial. So the observation is that phi is, can just become a polynomial if we ask it to extend to a map of P1. And furthermore, we ask the infinity of P1 to go to the infinity of P1. In other words, for the opposite disk, uh, we ask for the opposite disk, it sends like zero of the opposite disk to the zero, and no other point, no other point. Like only a pole uh, there. OK. And, and using this observation, we want to turn uh, our non-Archimedean problem into a more uh, uh, checkable algebraic uh, problem. Yeah. So this suggests a general strategy for obtaining a well-behaved modular space for non-Archimedean analytic disks uh, via a similar extension property. And the rough idea is the following. Uh, for the purpose of instanton corrections in SYZ mirror symmetry, uh, this boundary circle uh, of the disk, uh, actually, they lie in, in place where we have nice vibrations. Um, so they lie in the place where we have affinoid torus vibration. In other words, it's the place where it's locally isomorphic to the standard form. The standard form is simply analytification of the algebraic torus to Rn, given by taking coordinate-wise uh, valuation. And uh, we want this map. Now, I mean, we have a circle mapping to product of uh, uh, mapping to this uh, analy analytification of algebraic torus, it's really just uh, uh, very similar to what we had before, like higher dimensional generalization. Before we consider kind of circle or disk mapping to the disk, now it goes to some higher dimension uh, products. And, and both the circle and this target, they are standard, really standard form, and we want this map to be as simple as possible. And then we just impose the same uh, extension property. We say that uh, it, it extends just in the torus. So the fur furthest it can go is to go to some uh, toric boundary of some uh, toric compactification. Yeah, so motivated by the low dimensional examples as above, and we also studied some other low dimensional examples, uh, we propose the following boundary re regularity condition. We just ask that our circle, which already maps to this standard uh, tori, uh, we ask that it extends in the opposite direction to a disk, uh, such that the map extends to a map from the disk, from the opposite disk to some toric compactification, and uh, it touches the toric boundary only at zero. And uh, for this, uh, yeah, it touches only at zero. And here, the toric compactification really doesn't matter, because eventually it touches the toric compactification at only one point. So whatever <coughs> compactification is fine. We just want to express the idea that eventually it, the disk reaches somewhere. And geometrically, it means that, so, yeah, so geometrically, what does it mean? Because it, initially, we want to count uh, disks in some log Calabi variety Y 
uh, low calabial variety U with compactification Y. And now we have this uh, circle mapping to, to this uh, standard piece, standard uh, like tori torus, but a priori this torus and our initial low calabial variety, they have almost nothing to do with each other. So geometrically, uh, it means that we are gluing uh, the toric variety T to, uh, to our local labial or compactification Y along a small, uh, a small domain, uh, technically closed the polyhedral aphenoid domain, uh, where we have trivial aphenoid torus vibration. So uh, recall that we are interested in counting these red analytic disks in Calabial, and all we know is that the boundary of this red analytic disk lies in some small domain with a standard aphenoid torus vibration. And then the boundary condition we impose is that this orange, we can extend this boundary circle to the orange disk uh, such that this orange disk, uh, yeah, this orange disk lies in some toric variety. But this toric variety, this gray toric variety, and this black local labial variety, they really almost have nothing to do with each other except this small domain where they share this uh, standard aphenoid torus vibration. So, so since they really have nothing to do each, with each other except this small domain, we just glue them. Uh, naively glue them along this uh, very small gray domain. And we denote uh, this union, uh, the gluing by Z. So now, uh, if we are interested in uh, counting disks, these red disks uh, lying in uh, Y, satisfying some conditions uh, together with our uh, newly imposed boundary regularity condition, now it is equivalent to the moduli space of rational curves. Uh, in this rational curves, which is the union of the red analytic disk with the orange disk, D and the D prime, and it goes to a new target space, the modified target space, which is the union of the analytic space, our original uh, log calabial Y, analytic log calabial Y, together with uh, this gray auxiliary toric variety. And they only have in common along this gray area G, we just glue them along the gray area. And we ask that the red disk D goes to the part where we want it to go, the original local BL, satisfying any conditions we want. And then we ask the tail disk, the, D, the orange D prime, to go to uh, some auxiliary place this auxiliary toric variety, meeting the toric boundary only at zero. Okay. So, so we denote, now we have a rational curve, we denote uh, this union rational curve also as, uh, so we used to, we denoted by D union D prime, but uh, later, for later purpose, we also denote as B union E, B is just this D, because we think of it as the body that we really care, and the E is the end, it's the artificial end or artificial tail that we put on in order to get a well-defined moduli space. So, yeah, so, the, so here we really have kind of a big worry is that uh, we had our local ABL there, and then we have some gray toric variety which have very little to do with log calabial except along this gray area. Uh, so, so then we kind of artificially glue them together. Uh, whether it makes sense, it's not even <laughs> clear at the first sight. And uh, furthermore, such a glued space is not projective. It can't be projective when you glue something along this kind of open domain. And it's not even proper and not even separated. So then the, the worry is that how is it possible to uh, ever count the curves in such a strange glued space? Uh, how is it possible to obtain even a reasonable moduli space of curves 
So as I said, if we want to count something, we'd better study the modular space. And yeah, so that's the main worry. And it's also, uh, so although this idea, uh, we can guess it uh, like a long time ago, but it's very hard to actually uh, write down anything precise. Uh, and I, I consider the various special cases of this idea, but today I will really uh, describe the general case uh, where we actually uh, consider such bad gluings and see if we can get any reasonable properties for the modular space of so curves. Very similar does happen. June Lee's work on relative stable mass that keeps blowing up. Yeah, it's kind of, uh, he, he also changed the target by doing this uh, uh, blowing up the target uh, infinitely many times. It's uh, for a different purpose. Uh, he uh, do it, does it for the purpose of uh, tangency conditions with the boundary. Here we are, we are change, modif change, modifying the target space for the purpose of, uh, uh, of like the, the, the boundary of the unit disk. Yeah. It's kind of, a, I'm yeah. I'm just saying that it, that shows that it is sometimes possible to get back to a bounded modular mm. Yeah. Uh, it, it, the Jin, Jin Li's work is uh, more algebraic in nature. Uh, after you blow up, it's still algebraic variety. And uh, now, uh, also, we have uh, these logarithmic tools to reinterpret this uh, algebraic uh, uh, technique. Uh, here, uh, when we glue, we really completely leave the world of algebraic geometry. Uh, because even the gluing locus, it's, it's just an analytic domain. So, so uh, the idea is that, <coughs> I mean, it seems terrible, but the idea is that as long as we can keep the circle, the boundary circle, which is the, uh, where the two disks touch uh, together, as long as we keep the uh, circle away from the boundary of this great domain G, then the rest of the curve sh will not feel the non-separated locus of Z. So recall that uh, Z was obtained as a gluing of uh, our local ABR with some auxiliary toric variety along this uh, domain G. Oh, that's a great question. So when we glue, uh, whether G is open or whether G is closed, a priori it's not clear. And eventually in the proofs, we have to be very careful to let G sometimes be open and sometimes be closed. Because for some properties, we need G to be closed. For some other properties, we need G to be open. And eventually we have to show that it doesn't matter. <laughs> yeah. So here, uh, uh, we are gluing along this gray area G, and then we get a terrible non-separated space. Uh, but the idea is that somehow we shouldn't be afraid of this non-separated issue, because the only non-separatedness, the non-separatedness happens only at the boundary of G. Everywhere else, it's separated. And However you choose G to be open or closed, you are always going to get non-separated along the boundary of G. And then here we have our rational curve, and that is gluing of the orange disk with the red disk along this, uh, along this uh, small circle. And the idea is that as long as we impose that the small circle lies in the interior of this uh, gray area G, so that it doesn't touch the boundary of G, then our rational curve shouldn't feel this non-separated locus. Because the rational curve, for one side, for the red side, it already knows it has to go in Y. And for the orange side, it already knows that it has to go in T. And for their intersection, we just ask them, ask it to, to just stay in the interior of this gray area G then, we hope that it will be fine, that the curve knows nothing about the non-separated locus. Then the, everything should be fine. OK. So, so more precisely, to achieve that, 
we need to fix the marked point S on the circle uh, big S, uh, as, well as, as well as other marked points, PI, where uh, our curve touches the boundary, and we uh, let M U beta denote the moduli space of such curves in the glued target space, and we consider evaluation map. So we take domain, because now our domain has marked points, it has modulus, we take a domain, and also evaluation map at that particular marked point S. Yeah. Then the main theorem is that actually uh, this map, it's really nice. It's a finite et al. Uh, over an open neighborhood of the essential skeleton of the target. So once it's finite et al, we can take its degree. It's a, it will be a non-negative integer number. And we show that it gives the desired count of non-Archimedean analytic disks. And furthermore, the desired count is exactly the structure constants that we are looking for. And they give rise to a commutative associative mirror algebra, A. So if we take a spec of A, we are supposed to get the mirror variety by this construction. Yes. It's not the analytication of M0N. Uh, here, M0, ah, uh, here. Yeah. Uh, here, it, it, it's actually the, sorry, it's now for this, it's domain. It's now actually a rational curve with uh, N marked points because we have put on this uh, auxiliary tail, this oh. orange tail disk. Okay. Yeah, that's the usual one. Okay. Yeah, thank you, Paul, for the question. Um, so, uh, yeah, so we get a finite Adal map, and the degree is, uh, gives exactly what we want. And we can further show that, uh, uh, show slight, a bit more geometric properties uh, for, for the family we get from this uh, enumerative geometry. So we can show that the singularities are not too bad, and uh, the generic fibers are look, look like kind of the local RBL varieties that we start with. And of course, eventually, uh, we want to prove uh, more mirror symmetry statements about it, such as uh, Hodge numbers or uh, gromov witten invariants, uh, variation of Hodge structures, Fukai categories, and so on. Uh, there are some works uh, uh, in this direction uh, by many uh, 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 in special cases, like two-dimensional cases, uh, also special higher-dimensional case. But in this generality, I think it's still very hard to to get any uh, mirror symmetry statement in the uh, in in uh, in general, like either involving Fukaya category or involving uh, period this variation of Hodge structure or period cal calculations. Oh, here, uh, for this U, um, I think it, I assumed it to be a fine. The U is a local RBL. A fine local RBL. Oh, but actually, no, the, actually, we, one can do better like uh, to assume it's proper over a fine. That's probably the best one can do. Yeah, so, so, so here, to establish the main theorem, it really boils down to study properties of the moduli space, because the main theorem is the finite edanis of this map. And if we recall, in, our, in analytic geometry, in our Archimedean geometry, finite etal really consists of three properties, smooth, relative dimension zero, and the proper. Um, for smoothness, uh, uh, it's based on some non-Archimedean deformation theory uh, that I developed uh, with uh, Maolo. Uh, for, we used to develop it for a slightly different purpose, uh, but uh, the ingredients there are enough to imply the smoothness what we want here. And we also need a relative dimension zero. It will, uh, it, it's related to the volume form, because the volume form of the Calabial uh, is important to guarantee that the uh, 
expected dimensions of the moduli space are good. And the proper, and the harder part is the properness. So in algebraic geometry, properness is separated, the finite type, and the universally closed. In analytic geometry, we have to add one more property. So we need not only topologically proper, but also we want to ask that it has no boundary. Because like a closed unit disk, you wa don't want to call it proper. You only want a P1 to be proper. So here we have two parts, topologically proper and without boundary. And for this, we both use formal model uh, to the theory of formal models to reduce questions about non-Archimedean geometry to questions about uh, special fiber in algebraic geometry. And uh, that was, uh, that technique of formal model was uh, uh, in, in particular suggested by uh, Grosendik uh, when he learned about Tate's uh, uh, work on non-Archimedean geometry and the gross and suggested that maybe we can use formal models to translate everything about non-Archimedean geometry into algebraic geometry and apply all the tools from algebraic geometry to the study of non-Archimedean geometry. And in particular here, we will use a technique called the reduction of germs uh, developed by Michael Temkin. So before you turn on to the main theorem, you say uh, something about an associated algebra A? Yeah. Related to? To B, to your map. Oh, this, uh, this, uh, this map phi, we can kind of, uh, it, it's like just to set up the, the notations for counting the curves. So the degree of phi, uh, because when we say we count the curves, sometimes we have too many of them. Like uh, we have some continuous family. Then to actually get a number, we need to fix some condition that the curve passes through some points. And here, this phi exactly gives this condition because we ask the, some marked point to go somewhere. We kind of fix some conditions so that we get a finite number of curves. That's the use of this map. Yes. Yeah, the A is exactly, uh, A is the, the algebra and the, the, we describe A by describing its structure constants. And the structure constants are exactly given by this degree. Oh, thank you for the question. Yeah. So now we dive deeper into properties of the modular space of curves. Uh, uh, where the curves go into this glued target spaces. And uh, these properties are essential for the non-Archimedean uh, SYZ instant on corrections. Okay. So as I said, uh, eventually many properties that we need to establish in non-Archimedean geometry really goes back into algebraic geometry uh, via uh, the use of formal models reduct, uh, and the reduction of germs. So let me first illustrate this idea uh, for the condition of boundarylessness, without a boundary. Um, let me first recall uh, this idea of formal model uh, suggested by gross and Dick. Um, this is a very general story. Uh, we can have K, any non-Archimedean field with non-trivial valuation. Uh, you may say, well, here non-trivial before uh, may be trivial, but it doesn't matter. Uh, you can just... Uh, assume after base change the k is non-trivial valuation, we denote by k0 the ring of integers and the k tilde the residual field. So for example, if we take the Laurent series uh, field, ring of integers is power series, residual field is complex numbers, or if you take a periodic field, uh, this also works over any characteristic. If you take a periodic field, ring of integers is periodic integers, and uh, Residual field is finite field. Um, Renault's theory of uh, formal models, uh, it was suggested by Grossendick, and the Renault was a student of Grossendick. Uh, and the Renault, uh, yeah, so usually now it's called Renault's theory, but it's actually work 
a combination of works of a lot of people. Uh, Renault, uh, Bosch, Luc de Bermer, many people have worked on this uh, form of models. So one can conclude Renault's theory uh, in this form. It says that the generic fiber functor uh, from formal schemes locally topologically of finite type over the ring of integers to rigid k analytic spaces, it's Renault's <laughs> terminology for non-Archimedean geometry. Uh, you can just think of it as non-Archimedean analytic spaces. Um, it induces the equivalence between uh, the category of uh, formal schemes uh, with some finiteness property we don't uh, specify, uh, localized by the class of admissible formal blow-ups, I will explain in a moment, and the category of analytic spaces, also with some mild finiteness properties. So the theorem says that analytic spaces is almost the same as formal schemes, except we allow blow-ups along the special fiber. So if we have formal scheme, we take generic fiber, we get analytic space. But we know if we blow up with center in the special fiber, this doesn't change the generic fiber. And the Renault theory says that that's the only change you can make for the formal models. Mm. Assuming it's flat. Yeah. So, so here, uh, we want to apply formal models to our situation. But unfortunately, formal model does not apply to uh, the Lin Manford or Artin stacks uh, because eta or smooth k analytic morphisms may not have uh, eta smooth formal models. When we work with this enumerative geometry based on Gromov Witten theory, we always have this issue with the stacks. It's kind of uh, intuitively, it shouldn't bother us, but technically, it causes a lot of trouble. Yeah. So in order to bring for the two of formal models to the study of non-Archimedean uh, geometry, I just need to prove, do it for, for uh, the space of stable maps. Because although we can't have formal models in general for the Lima for the Artin stacks, but uh, fortunately, we can do it for stable maps. So in particular, I showed that uh, for stable maps, we can actually have a formal model which is also given by stable maps uh, itself. So if we consider uh, curly X, a formal scheme, locally of finite presentation over the ring of integers, and we have a family of uh, analytic stable maps into the generic fiber of this uh, curly X, uh, parametrized by some uh, analytic base, uh, then we can have formal model. But uh, we need to allow some eta cover of the base, and we will have a formal model uh, of everything. So, so, so we will have formal model for the base, formal model for the curve, and this f also extends to the formal model, and formal model for all the marked points. And it is formal model in the sense that if I take a generic fiber of everything, I get back uh, the analytic family of stable maps uh, into, the, into the, uh, the generic fiber here. Basically stable reduction. It's not just curves, because here it's stable maps. So definitely, we have to use stable reduction for curves. But it's it, relative to the average. I'm just yeah, I think it's definitely, we have to use stable reduction of curves, but just making the domain good is not enough. Uh, yeah, the reason is that we also need to extend the map. Uh, we also, we start from stable reduction of curves, then we still need to change a little bit. Uh, sections, they are marked points. Because we fix some marked points, and sections, they are marked points. So this might be hard to parse, the long sentence. But uh, one can just uh, uh, summarize as this. So if I have some formal scheme as target, now if I can consider 
moduli of stable maps into the formal scheme, and then I take special fiber. This is equivalent to cons this is equivalent to the moduli space of stable maps into the special fiber. So moduli space of formal stable special fiber of the moduli space of formal stable maps into the formal scheme is equivalent to the moduli space of stable maps, in algebraic stable maps into the special fiber of the formal scheme. And uh, similarly, uh, this generic fiber of the moduli space of, form of formal stable maps into the formal scheme, curly X, is equivalent to the moduli space of stable analytic stable maps into the generic fiber. It's easier to read the symbols than to <laughs> listen to the words. Um, yeah. So formal models enable us to reduce analytic properties of the generic fiber from algebraic properties of the special fiber. And this is really a special feature of non-Archimedean analytic geometry that is absent in complex analytic geometry. So that also makes non-Archimedean analytic geometry as like uh, more closer to algebraic geometry. And uh, one particular tool for this uh, uh, relation between analytic properties of generic fiber and the algebraic property of the special fiber is provided by the theory of Temkin, Temkin's reduction of germs. Yeah, let me uh, give you the rough idea of Temkin. So, uh, so he considers uh, the following category. Um, so the category, uh, the objects are pointed varieties, so-called pointed varieties over the residual field. A pointed K tilde variety consists of just a variety over the residual field Z and a field extension of this residual field, a big K and then a map from spec K to Z. So you can think of this as first some variety over uh, some variety over the residual field, like something in the special fiber, and then some generic point. We pick some generic point. So morphism, and this spec K is the generic point. The morphism of pointed K tilde varieties are just uh, these commutative squares. So motivated by Renault's uh, theory, uh, we consider a quotient category or localization category. So we have this ca category of pointed K tilde varieties, and we localize it by the class B, class of morphisms, where uh, this map along the K tilde variety is proper, and the map along this generic points is an isomorphism. So we really care is like these generic points, and these pieces are kind of formal models, special fiber of formal models, and as long as, and we kind of allow them, allow some change by these blow ups. Okay, and the, why it serves as a very nice uh, local model, uh, like for the special fiber, is that given any analytic space X and the point, uh, point in the analytic space, and a formal model uh, curly X, then we obtain naturally uh, an element in this localization category. Because first of all, if we can take the special fiber of the formal model, we get uh, the special fiber, and then I also have a kind of a canonical generic point here. Uh, it's given by, so here I have a point in the analytic space, I have a, uh, the analytic residual field, because everything in the in analytic geometry have norm, so the residual field also have norm. In particular, it is a normed field or field with valuation, and we can take the associated residual field. It's like a residual field of the residual field. Uh, and that gives the canonical generic point there. So by Reynolds theory, uh, its image inside of the localization category, when we localize with respect to all these uh, class of morphisms, now it becomes independent of the choice of formal model. So that's really nice because now it's something canonically associated to 
every germ of uh, analytic space. And it's something in algebraic geometry. And if you think this construction of localization category as something a bit ad hoc, actually one can also give a geometric interpretation of this quotient category via classical Riemann Zariski spaces. So Temkin proved that a K analytic space uh, is good at a point, meaning that it has an affinoid neighborhood if and only if its reduction is affine. In other words, it has a affine model. And furthermore, it sh he showed that a, ma a morphism of analytic spaces is separated at a point if and only if the reduction morphism is separated. And if a point lies in the interior, because what we really worry is the boundary. And now, Temkin also gives a, a criterion for a point to be in, in the interior in terms of uh, this uh, uh, reduction, in terms of algebraic geometry. So he proves that some point lies in the interior uh, if and only if the reduction map is, is proper. So in other words, it admits separated uh, or proper or respectively proper model. And this is really the key ingredient that we use uh, to turn uh, questions in non-Archimedean geometry into questions like more tractable questions in algebraic geometry. So now let's go back to our moduli space of curves in the glued target space. Yeah. But then you're actually getting a, a non-trivial, you're not getting just a point for special time, you're getting a, a non-trivial variety. Yeah. You get a little confused. So it's, it's, it, it's something that I should think about as a generic point of view. Yeah. Uh, um, so what is this, can you explain what is going on here? What is this affine? Is it saying that that, that, that is um, in the interior of a component of the special time? But we really hear. Uh, actually, I think about this condition, it should be affine. I'm not sure. Because this condition of being good is something tricky in non-Archimedean geometry. Uh, why I list it here? Because it goes to the proof of two. But actually, whether a point is good, usually anything you encounter, you encounter is good. So, but for the proof of two, he has to first do it to prove it for this good property. Oh, so Otherwise, we can have a examples, but it's kind of artificial exam. Yeah. yeah, pathological examples. I mean, it, most of them just have a fine models. <laughs> yeah. So let uh, thank you for the, for the question. Um, so let's go back to our moduli space of curves in the glued target space, and where we glued along this gray G. The, a closed polyhedral affinoid domain where the non-Archimedean SYZ vibration uh, is a trivial affinoid torus vibration. So as Paul asked whether G is open or closed, let's first, uh, yeah, here we assume G is closed. Uh, if we glue two topological spaces along some closed domain, we get a compact Hausdorff K analytic, we get some a topological space that is Hausdorff, but as an analytic space, it's still not going to be separated because in algebraic geometry, separateness means uh, we want the diagonal to be closed embedding. And here, although the underlying topological space is uh, separated, is housed off, but uh, in term, as an analytic space, it's not separated. So that's why, uh, to, uh, that's why we also need uh, something open. So we consider a smaller uh, polyhedral domain H in G uh, that's open, such that the closure lies in G. Then we just apply Reynolds formal model to everything. We still have everything in analytic geometry. We apply Reynolds formal model uh, to everything, and we get the uh, formal models of everything. Also, we can glue the formal models together. All the polyhedral domains have the formal model. And if we have some ample line bundles, we also glue all the ample line bundles together. 
Um, in order to be precise, we'd better take into account all the marked points. Do I have a picture? Yeah. So we add all these marked points pi to the, to the red disk where it hits the boundary. And we add this marked point s to the circle. And we also add a marked point e to the tail disk where it hits the boundary of the toric, toric uh, auxiliary toric variety. Uh, formal models doesn't require proper. It always exists. Okay. Only requires this very weak uh, para-compact, uh, okay. para-quasi-separated. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So here I use the letter S and E to denote uh, starting point and ending point of this tail. OK. And uh, now. Uh, we just need to be a bit more careful because somehow we want to use this point S to separate our marked points into two groups, all the P marked points and the one E marked point. And we don't want any P to lie like on the other side. So for this purpose, we just choose this, uh, we choose the locus in the modular space of uh, pointed curves so that uh, S separates E from all the P's. And th that's easy to do. Uh, using tropical geometry, we just uh, pick the associated tropical locus where S and E, they are connected to each other to a three-valent vertex. And then we take a pre-image uh, by the tropical map. And uh, for any curve in this locus, as I said, now S separates all the PIs from E. So we can cut uh, using S, this marked point. We cut any curve uh, in this um, locus into, now we can cut it into two disks, body and the end, uh, where the end just contains E, and the body contains all the other marked points, PI. Now we uh, introduce this modular space, modular stack of stable maps into this glue glue the target y glue with t such that uh, put the usual conditions the degree is nice the degree is given uh, the marked points goes to where we want uh, with multiplicities greater or equal to what we want yeah uh, so we first need to assume this greater or equal to because we want to get something proper uh, in the beginning. Um, yeah. And here we have some worry because when always such a worry in gromov witten theory because we may have some bubbles that of the domain curve that maps to the boundary, which we don't like. Because we only want to count curves like this and in and we don't want to have bubbles in the domain which completely goes to the boundary. I'm sorry for all the questions, but this, this, this circle, a uh, capital S, um, that, you have some map from C to its tropicalization, which is just like the inverse. Is that, is that, you know, you have some, sorry, you have, you have, you have your curve yeah. that has some map to this tree, and you just take the inverse image of a point that gives you the circle containing the, the uh, poly, poly curve, yeah. is that correct? Yeah, it depends which place you choose. If uh, the point is in the interior of the edge, you get a circle. But if you pick this point, you get a pair of pants. So, so I'm just saying, when you drew the picture of the P1 divided into two disks, how do you get that circle, capital S, from the point to the left? Oh, how to get the circle? Yeah. Uh, yeah, we have to take the tropical curve and pick, uh, pick the pre-image. It's exactly what you said. Yeah, I'm not sure. Because that lag, because that lag, the, the S corresponds to a lag, and that lag is now connected to this three valent vertex. And now the pre image we take is the whole lag together ah. with the point. Okay. Because if we just take a pre image of that point, we get a pair of pants. Uh -huh. And then you fill this hole with this lag S. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So as I said, we don't want bubbles. And in order to, uh, and we also use a modular space where we have no bubbles. 
So no components uh, maps to the boundary. Yeah, and then, so for the moment, we haven't uh, imposed the condition that the, the body and the end go to desirable places. And for now, we consider this sub subspace M to be the locus where the body goes to Y, the end goes to T, and we ask the marked point little s to go to H. So H is a smaller, now a smaller open polyhedral affinoid domain living inside the G. So we have an important observation is that these conditions can be reformulated uh, into the open body goes to Y, uh, open, now we consider in, instead of closed unit disk, we consider open unit disks. So we ask the open body go to Y, open end go to T, and uh, the circle go to H. And the equivalence follows from the maximum modulus pr principle. Then first we, uh, we shown we prove that this locus, now we start to establish properties for these locuses, this low set. So we show that this locus is intersection of an open analytic domain and a closed analytic domain. And furthermore, we show that M is an analytic stack without a boundary. So as I said, all the proofs uh, uses Temkin's technique to reduce to special fiber. Um, here is, uh, so we have domain analytic curve uh, like this. And then the special fiber will be a tree of uh, like a lot of uh, spheres. And now we consider formal models of everything. And we reinterpret our conditions in terms of uh, maps into the special fiber. Then the corresponding locus in the special fiber can be shown that it is the intersection of a Zariski open and a Zariski closed. And by the anti-continuity of the reduction map that relates special fiber with generic fiber, it becomes intersection of open analytic domain and the closed analytic domain. And for boundary, as I said, for boundarylessness, we, now we need to consider some other special fiber. And that's why we sometimes have G, sometimes have H. We glue along, sometimes glue along open, sometimes along closed. And for the purpose of boundarylessness, we consider uh, this gluing along H. And we, again, reformulate all the conditions in the generic fiber in terms of stable maps into the special fiber. <clears throat> and we show that the corresponding locus in the special fiber is proper and by Temkin's reduction of germs, uh, we get a boundarylessness, uh, boundaryless condition. Yeah, uh, I think I have, I can go until ten, uh, right? Well, Noon, <laughs> because we started at ten, I think. Um, so okay, uh, that is for the condition of uh, without a boundary. Um, next, uh, let me talk about compactness, because as we remember, properness in analytic geometry has two parts. Uh, like first, properness in the topological sense, or compactness here, and uh, without a boundary. So we already uh, established boundarylessness. Now let's talk about compactness, and for this purpose. We need an alternative boundary condition for our uh, analytic disks. So what is this? Yeah, as I said, we showed that uh, our moduli space has no boundary, but it's not compact. Uh, and for compactness, we need some alternative uh, condition. Uh, so we. Just now, we composed our domain curve into two closed disks by cutting along, this, uh, along the circle determined by the marked point S. And the next, we thicken the circle S into an open annulus. So we thicken the circle a little bit. The circle is the locus where the norm of X is 1, and now we just thicken it 
to 1 minus epsilon, 1 plus epsilon. And for this, we add two more marked points, A and B, uh, to denote where like the new, the, the bunch, how far we go uh, from left to right. Yeah, so now we can decompose our domain curve into an open disk union, uh, this open annulus union, uh, another open end disk. And uh, similarly, we have to choose the right locus uh, in the modular space of domain so that the decomposition makes sense. And now we consider the locus of the modular space of stable maps uh, where the open bound body goes to Y, the open end goes to T, uh, annulus goes to G, and the, the mark point goes to H. So, so for this locus M prime, we show that it is a closed analytic domain. And furthermore, the associated map phi is topological, topologically proper. So here you see that we proved some locus has no boundary, but that locus actually will not be compact. And for compactness, we need to change to a different locus, M prime. So same idea of proof, we use the formal model uh, in order to reduce the question to the special fiber. So finally, to combine the compactness uh, with, uh, with boundarylessness, uh, we need to be, care more, be more careful and study the bubbling phenomena uh, in this question. Yeah, so as I said, we had this locus M where we showed uh, some boundarylessness and we had another locus M prime given by another set of conditions uh, where we proved uh, compactness. So now we want to mix them together. So first of all, the other locus has more marked points. We just add to M also these dummy marked points. And the, the key observation is that uh, although these two loci, they are different, but we can make them to be equal as long as uh, we impose some condition on the marked point S. So as long as uh, the tropicalization of the image of S stays away from the walls in the essential skeleton, and this epsilon, the thickness of the open annulus, is sufficiently small, then actually these two moduli spaces, these two loci can be equivalent. So therefore, away from the walls, we have this equality, and now we can combine the boundarylessness of the, that we established the first and the topological properness that we established established uh, the second, and we combine them together, we get the analytic properness of phi. So furthermore, we need to take care of bubbles, because we don't want any bubbles to go to the boundary. Um, so in order to extend the properness result to curves without a boundary, without a boundary bubbles, uh, we must take into account also the associated spines. So for this purpose, we have our modular space of curves. We have the map phi. And now we consider the associated tropical curve, or more precisely, the associated spines, which means uh, the convex union of the tropical, uh, convex, convex hull of the, all the marked points in the tropical curve. Then we also have the associated tropical version for the map phi. So once we take into account the spines, we can show that as long as the spine is transverse, meaning that it's transverse to all the walls, the walls are really the lo locus in the essential skeleton that causes us all the trouble, and then uh, we can make the map to be the moduli space, ma map from the moduli space to be proper uh, 
and also ensure that no bubbles goes to the boundary. Yeah, so, so here what we really want to ensure is that when we have a limiting family uh, of maps without bubbles, then in the end we don't get a bubble. And for that, I have some pictures showing how, uh, why it works. Um, so we really want to make sure that we don't get a bubble. Even if we eventually may get some bubble in the body, but we don't want a bubble in all these caps. So, uh, so it combines all the properties of walls. Uh, as well as some maximal modulus principle in our Archimedean geometry. Okay, so in the final less than one minute, uh, I will say a few words about smoothness. That's one another property for the etalness uh, that we need. So here, uh, a distinguished feature of this non-Archimedean uh, approach versus the logarithmic approach uh, is the freeness of analytic curves, that we can really have a lot of freedom for the analytic curves. And we establish this smoothness via non-Archimedean deformation theory. So, um, although uh, the deformation theory in non-Archimedean geometry, it's possible to do it by hand, uh, like as in the book by Robert and Romero, but since Mauro and I, we already have a more general theory of derived non-Archimedean geometry, so we just applied our more general theory, uh, which is essentially the uh, main thing is the theory of analytic cotangent complex to the moduli space here, and uh, we just uh, apply the whole thing. Uh, I think I have, it's just the general properties of analytic, analytic cotangent complex, so we apply the general theory, we show the smooth, smoothness of the map. Okay, uh, thank you very much for your attention. So, in the time, I'm gonna ask people to ask a question privately during lunch. Okay.